Hi everyone and welcome back to Good Morning KU Sports. I am your anchor Katie and we have an absolutely action-packed show for you today. First off, Will will take us through the NBA tra trade deadline and which big names could be on the move. He will also break down some crucial role players that could make or break a contending team's chance at the title this season. Next, we will swing it over to Lily, who will continue our NBA coverage with a deep dive into the 2024 All-Star and Rising Stars games, which will take place in two weeks. Then, we will switch sports, with Owen breaking down his top five NFL prospects for the upcoming draft in April. Then Ryan will have a great rundown of the game everyone is talking about on campus this weekend. That's right. Kansas versus Houston in Allen Fieldhouse this Saturday is going to be electric, and Ryan will have all the details on the highly anticipated top 10 matchup. After that, Emily has a very in-depth recap of the Kansas women's swim team season and the Jayhawks team success. Lastly, we will have a KU baseball preview from Ryan and why Kansas could surprise in year two under Dan Fitzgerald. To close out the show, we will have one final break, and then Sam has an incredible KU Athletics weather breakdown for the upcoming games. I loved our old intro. The new one is just so cool and sets the stage for a great show. Now, let's over to Will, who has a special segment on the upcoming NBA trade deadline. Thanks, Katie. With only six day more days to go till the NBA trade deadline, there's sure to be plenty of shifting around that occurs, whether it be teams trying to solidify themselves as playoff contenders or to sell some pieces for their future. There's a lot to look forward to. First, let's look back at the two biggest trades that have occurred so far. On January 17th, the Raptors traded for Pal Seekham to the Indiana Pacers in a three-team trade involving the Pelicans. For the Pacers, mixed results so far. They lost their first three games with Spy CP, but rebounded back in a big way to win their next three, which included his sixth career triple-double against the 76ers. So far, he's averaging just over 20 points with Indiana, but most of, his, most of this comes without teammate and an NBA assist leader, Tyrese Halberton, who missed his next five games after Sykem's debut. With Sykem showing a high level play without Halberton, it's only a, one can only imagine how fun it will be to see him and Halberton together on the court full time. And then came another big trade on January 23rd with Horn's trading guard Terry Rosser to the Heat in exchange for Kyle Lowry and a 2027 lottery projected first round pick. Pairing Rosser up with Tyler Harrow at the Miami, the Miami backcourt will give that team plenty of offensive firepower, but there are serious questions about how they can hold up defensively. The team lost their first three games with Rosser starting, but won Wednesday night to break a seven-game lose streak. Though there are questions about this new Miami backcourt, he coach Eric Spolestra is one of the best in the league and should be trusted with figuring out the best rotation for his team. Now, with those two trades out of the way, let's look ahead at what action could happen before the 2 p.m. Tra trade deadline. The team to keep an eye on this week is the Mavericks. They took a huge swing last trade deadline for Kyrie Irving in their latest attempt to find Luka Doncic. Though there isn't a star available this time around, the team could be one of the most aggressive buyers in the deadline in order to turn their season around. They don't have a deep asset pool to choose from, but can dangle out future picks as trade bid. What the Mavericks need right now is a shot-creating two-way forward, hence their continued interest in Washington forward Kyle Kazuma. The question now is how big Dallas is willing to go, and do they even have the trade chips to pry a player like Kazuma? If not, look for them to go after quality stars like Doran Finley-Smith or Miles Bridges. Well, that's all I've got for today, and it's a lot to think about, huh, Kate? It sure is, Will. As a diehard Nuggets fan, I'm watching teams in the Western Conference, including the Mavericks, closely, and I'm hoping no superstars are traded out West. But the next two weeks will be electric for NBA fans, as countless players will be on the move and teams will look completely different. Also adding to the NBA excitement is the upcoming All-Star Weekend. Let's swing over to Lily for an in-depth breakdown. 
You're right, Katie. NBA All-Star Weekend takes place from February 16th to the 18th in Indianapolis, Indiana, home of the Indiana Pacers. You have your usual events, the Rising Stars game, Skill Challenge, Three Point Contest, Slam Dunk Contest, and now the newly made, anticipated Steph vs. Sabrina Three Point Challenge. The biggest topic so far is the All-Star Game, where there have been many players to discuss. The starters were announced last week and are as follows. In the West front court are Kevin Durant, LeBron James, who now holds the record for most All-Star appearances with 20, and Nikola Jokic. The starting guards are Luka Doncic and Shea Gilgis Alexander. Giannis Antetokounmpo, Joel Embiid, and Jason Tatum are in the East front court. The starting guards for them are Tyrese Halliburton with his first All-Star starter appearance and Damian Lillard. You may notice a big name missing from the starters. For the first time since 2014, Stephen Curry is not a starter uh, on the All-Star team. This brought along the conversation for players who were snubbed for being a starter, even though the reserves were announced yesterday. Jalen Brunson is a big name in the East who was not given the start. The Knicks are on a run right now, holding their opponents to under 100 points, and audiences are starting to notice. Many people are saying that Lillard's spot should have been given to Brunson, as he is averaging more points per game and is shooting more consistently. Trey Young in the East is also a topic of conversation with the season he had. Anthony Edwards was also left off, but he was announced as a reserve yesterday. Ultimately, starters are only five players, leading to fans being upset that their favorite player was left off. Some of the Rising Stars players were also announced, and these include Paolo Bancaro, Dyson Daniels, Jalen Duran, Jaden Ivey, Walker Kessler, Benedict Matherin, and Victor Wimbanyama. That's all I have for you today. Back to Katie to introduce the next segment. Thanks, Lily, for all the know in the NBA. It's a little crazy to me that Steph isn't a starter for the first time in forever, but I'm incredibly excited about his three-point contest matchup versus Sabrina during All-Star Weekend. Now, let's head over to Owen, who will be previewing some top NFL draft prospects. Thanks, Katie. With the Super Bowl quickly approaching, let's talk about a topic that's on every football fan's mind, the NFL Draft. <laughs> I'm joking, of course, but what can I say? It's never too early for draft coverage, am I right? Anyways, let's get into my top five prospects in this year's draft. At number five, I have Notre Dame tackle Joe Alt. The biggest debate in terms of offensive tackles this draft cycle has been between Alt and Penn State's Olu Fushanu. Fushanu is fantastic in his own right. He'll probably also be a top 10 pick, but I'm taking Joe Alt because he is a more refined pass protector, and Olu Fushanu gave up five quarterback hurries and a sack against Ohio State and JT Tui Moloau, which is a little concerning. But in terms of Joe Alt's play, he was fantastic all around. This tape, look at the left tackle, number 76. He is a really quick first step and wins reps against speed and power moves alike. He's also an absolute mauler in the run game, and he created huge lanes for star running back Audric Estime. Any team in the top 10 would be well served to take this absolute wall of a human being. My number four prospect is Georgia tight end Brock Bowers. Calling him a tight end is almost disrespecting his game because this guy is an all-around offensive weapon. He does so much damage after the catch. It's almost George Kittle-esque. And to top it all off, he's a great run blocker as well. Bowers is an excellent separator, but he can come down with contested catches when needed and has great hands. It's hard to find a flaw with Bowers, and the only reason he's not a top 10 lock is that tight end isn't a super high value position. Number three is going to be North Carolina quarterback Drake May. He is solidly the second best quarterback in this class after a guy who I'll cover in a bit, but he's still a fantastic player. May has an absolute cannon of an arm, and he throws deep passes with beautiful touch and perfect placement. He also excels outside of the pocket on the run. He has a Josh Allen-esque ability to make crazy highlight plays out of structure that in most cases would end, in would end in an interception. This gunslinger mentality has hurt him a little, though, as he threw nine interceptions against his 24 touchdowns, a regression from his fantastic 2022 season. Uh, still, he's much more refined of a prospect than Josh Allen was, and those issues can be fixed by a good coaching staff. Drake May has all the tools to be a franchise quarterback for many years to come. At number two, I have Ohio State wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, what can I say about this guy that hasn't already been said? He's incredible in nearly every facet of the game. He is incredibly fast for his size at 6'4", 200 pounds. He can run the full route tree and is great at creating separation. He can make contested catches and he has a wide catch radius. He's great at making adjustments on the ball in the air. Uh, need I go on? There isn't a single weakness to his game and it would be a crime if he fell out of the top three. MHJ is going to be a beast for whoever drafts him. My number one prospect of the 2024 NFL Draft is USC quarterback Caleb Williams. Uh, this should be a surprise to precisely no one. Uh, Williams, despite only leading USC to a 7-5 record in the games he played, was electric this season. His ability to improvise and make plays out of structure is second to none. He's a player that can thrive even behind the worst of offensive lines. 
The biggest knock on him is his average time to throw, which is pretty high at 3.21 seconds. For context, most scrambling quarterbacks in the NFL are around 2.7 seconds. This isn't an indictment of Williams as a prospect, in my opinion, and he has shown the ability to process defenses at a high level despite his lengthy time to throw. Williams is a master of the big play, shredding defenses down the field regularly. And even though they didn't run a ton of it at USC, he, threw, he showed good anticipation and precision in the short game as well. Whoever ends up having the first overall pick in April, whether it's the Bears or a team that trades up, won't have a very tough decision to make with Caleb Williams on the board. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with Ryan, who is going to give us a look at a KU's matchup against Houston this weekend. Miss the bus again? Yeah. You should download My Bus Lawrence. You can see when buses are arriving here, and you can also see where the buses are in Lawrence. Wow, okay. Download the My Bus Lawrence app today. Thanks for sticking with us. I'm Ryan, and we have an exciting matchup on deck tomorrow afternoon. Not only is this one of the most anticipated games of the year in the Big 12, but in all of college basketball this season. The Houston Cougars are currently ranked number four and will make their first ever trip to Allen Fieldhouse as a member of the Big 12 this Saturday. Houston comes into this game boasting a 19-2 overall record and currently sit on top of the Big 12 with a conference record of 6-2, the only two losses coming both on the road against Iowa State and TCU in close losses. Kansas comes into this game with a 17-4 overall record and are currently tied with TCU for third place in the Big 12 with a 5-3 conference record. It'll be interesting to see how Kansas handle, handles the physicality of Houston. The Cougars are known for their elite defense, holding the number one scoring defense in golf college basketball, and have two stars in their backcourt, Jamal Shedd, who is a high-level point guard who can do it all on the court, and LJ Cryer, Prior to who is the best two for the Cougars, shooting at a 37.8% clip. Don't sleep on Emmanuel Sharp either, who averages double figures a game. The Cougars are also one of the best rebounding teams in the country, out rebounding their opponents by an average of eight, eight a game. If Kansas wants to win this game, they're going to have to hold their own on the boards and need big games from Hunter Dickinson, Kevin McCuller, and especially K.J. Adams, both offensively and defensively. This is pretty close to a must-win game for KU if the Jayhawks want to get back into the thick of the Big 12 race, with trips to Waco, Lubbock, and Houston still looming. Kansas has to hold serve at home for a chance to keep up in the race. The fog will be absolutely rocking tomorrow in the biggest home conference game of the year, to be an unreal atmosphere in Lawrence. Wow, Ryan, thanks for that great update. The game on Saturday is gonna be such a fun environment and a really great game. I personally can't wait to see the matchup of point guards between Dewan Harris and Jamal Shedd. Now, let's head over to Emily, one of our producers of Good Morning KU Sports for a KU Swim and Dive update. Thank you, Katie. I'm Emily, and usually I'm behind the camera running our show every week, but the KU Swimming and Diving team had a great season that is too good to share. The Kansas Jayhawks women's swimming and dive team are beginning to wrap up their final meets of the seasons after starting it early October of 2023. Kicking it back to before our winter break, the Jayhawks hosted Rockhurst in their own Robinson Natatorium on December 2nd. Starting with the diving, freshman Xun Lai placed first in the three-meter diving event, amassing 332.18 points, while sophomore Lise Van Leeuwen came right up behind Lai in second place with a score of 330.15 points. Gabriela San Juan Carmona rounded out the podium for the Jayhawks in third place with a score of 319.28 points. When the Jayhawks competed on the one meter board, all five top places were taken by the Jayhawks, with Lai in first place once again. I was a diver in my prime, so seeing the Jayhawks come out on top is super exciting for me. When looking at the swimming portion of the meet, the Jayhawks also came out on top. For the women's 100-yard freestyle, senior Claudia Dugan came in first place with a time of 51.1 seconds. Sophomore Caroline Blake was right behind Dugan with a time of 51.87 seconds, and sophomore Haley Farrell followed with a time of 52.48 seconds. These top three finishers gave the Jayhawks 16 points toward their meet score. After a long day of events, the Jayhawks defeated Rockhurst with a final meet score of 177 points to 62. In KU's final home meet of the season against Arkansas, the Jayhawks unfortunately fell to the Razorbacks, 178 points to 128 points. However, the Divers found success at this meet, finishing in all top four places on the three-meter. San Juan Carmona led the Jayhawks in first, with Lai in second. Van Leeuwen finished third, and senior Warren Grabowski closely snatching an NCAA zone cut. 
The swimming portion of the meet ended with a lot of second place finishes with freshman Grayson O'Mara in second for the 1,000 yard freestyle and freshman Ryan Johnson placed second in the 100 yard breaststroke with a one minute four second time and Haley Farrell was back this meet in second in the 400 meter IM. These meets are rounding out the end of the 2023-2024 season for the women's swimming and diving team. The Jayhawks aren't done, however, and they head up to Ames this... They're coming to Ames for a meet against the Iowa State Cyclones on February 9th, there's the date, and 10th for the last regular season meet. The Big 12 Championship for Swimming and Diving is in Morgantown, West Virginia, February 27th to March 2nd, followed by the NCAA Zone Diving Meet in Houston, March 11th through the 13th. Be on the lookout in late March for the NCAA Swimming and Diving Championships. Thank you for that great rundown, Emily. Congrats to KU Swim and Dive so far on a great season. Now, stay tuned for an in-depth KU baseball preview from Luke and our weekly sports weather report from Sam. Thanks, Katie. Um, our, we are just two more weeks away from the college baseball season starting, and there is a lot to look forward to. The Jayhawks did not have their best season last year, ending with a record of 25-32 and 32 overall while going 8-16 and 16 in the Big 12. While they didn't end with a winning record, there are still some positives to look at. It was also Dan Fitzgerald's first season as head coach, and he led the team to getting five more wins than the season before and a Big 12 tournament appearance where they ended up taking down nationally ranked Texas in the first round. Looking at this upcoming season, the Jayhawks have their first game against Illinois Chicago from February 16th through the 18th and their home opener against Texas Southern on March 1st. One big game to look out for is the border showdown between Kansas and Missouri, which will be played in Kauffman Stadium for the second straight season. The team record hasn't been the only thing improving recently, as the new uniforms that have been dropping get better and better with each one. My personal favorite would have to be the baby blue retro uniforms. I mean, the patterns with the old logo and the hat uh, really complete the tough look and it just stands out. Another good one is the Kansas City Monarch style uniform that they wore for the Buck O'Neill Classic. Um, you just can't beat that style. The Jayhawks look to keep improving and make another Big 12 tournament appearance as well as a potential playoff run. The schedule may be hard, but we will see what the Jayhawks can do. After a short break, Sam will be back with our weekly weather report and what it'll be like for all of the contests this weekend. Natural Ties, a club full of friendship, community, and fun. Pairing individuals in the Lawrence community with disabilities to KU students, in efforts to foster meaningful connections that last a lifetime. We host events bi-weekly on Wednesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. Some of our favorite events include Trunk or Treat, The Back to School Cookout, and Neon Night. Follow us on Instagram today and come join us to see how special Natural Ties truly is to us. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, someone needs to clean this camera quite badly. But anyway, welcome back to Good Morning KU Sports and happy Groundhog Day as well. If you did not hear, Pakistani Phil predicted that we were going to have an early spring. And I don't know if you should trust the Groundhog when it comes to weather prediction or not, but I tell you what, looking at the next week, eh, the Groundhog might actually be onto something. But anyway, we're sitting at 52 degrees right now. It's mostly sunny, but I expect clouds to build back in throughout the day. And looking at the satellite view here, there is a lot of cloud cover in the northeast and also out in the mountain west. Whereas here in Lawrence right now, we are fairly clear for the most part, but again, there's clouds all around us and it should move back overhead as the day goes on. Hour by hour today, we're going to reach a high of around 66 this afternoon before dropping back down into the mid 50s this evening. These winds are going to be st decently strong today and that is part of a weather system that's going to move in overnight. For tonight, it's going to, be at a, going to drop down to about 49 degrees and a low pressure system to our southwest is going to intensify and that will bring rain chances for most of the day tomorrow and then early Sunday morning. It looks to be fairly spotty tomorrow with the bulk of it being on that early Sunday morning just after midnight. 
And looking at the forecast here, if you look at about the northeastern part of New Mexico, you can see low pressure systems start to develop there, move off to the east as the day goes on. That's going to bring a whole bunch of humid air from the Gulf up towards us. And it'll be fairly spotty Saturday, but then as you saw Sunday, it really starts to move in. Zooming out here to the national view, you can see the rain we're getting here in Lawrence. But look out at California there for this weekend and into early next week. They're going to get an atmospheric river event, which is going to cause some major flooding concerns there in the Southern California area, especially for Los Angeles. With the National Weather Service in Los Angeles saying, especially Sunday through Monday night, there's a chance for life-threatening and damaging flooding there. Now, I will say that the newest information is a bit less bullish on the rainfall totals, but there will still be a good amount of rainfall. Could be probably, this says three to six, now probably more closer from two to five inches of rainfall, but that's still enough to cause some flooding on roads and highways especially. Now moving back here to a local scale for the big game tomorrow against number four Houston. Again, chance of showers for the whole period tomorrow from pregame to the final buzzer. And I can only imagine how early some students are going to show up to try and get in line for this game. They are going to get wet. Very good chance of that. Quick turnaround for the team as on Monday they are in Manhattan taking on K-State in the Sunflower Showdown. Temperatures there will be closer to the low 40s around tip-off and it will be clear conditions for that one. Going on to the sports big board here which this week is not all that big. But anyway the track and field team will be in Lincoln, Nebraska today and tomorrow. Chance of rain there tomorrow. And women's golf will be in Orlando for the UCF Challenge. Well, it looks to be rain. Possible storms are actually all Sunday through Tuesday for that one. So being golf, being outdoors, probably a good chance of some impacts there. And now going on to the seven day forecast. Again today, top out around 66 degrees before the rain chances move in Saturday and into Sunday morning. Then come next week, we warm back up into the 60s before our next chance of precipitation is Thursday evening. Looking at this middle of next week, yeah, that groundhog might actually be on to something. Anyway, over to you, Katie. Thank you for that great weather update, Sam. That will do it from us, and we hope everyone has a very happy Groundhog Day. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Good Morning KU Sports. Stay tuned for Playmakers at noon, and we'll be back next week with another great show at 10. Enjoy your weekend and rock chalk.